Thank you. Dear Lord, thank you so much for waking us up this Sabbath morning and helping us to be able to gather together, Lord. Um, we just ask for forgiveness of our sins and ask that you would um, be with us this morning, as well as those who are not able to join us and who will be joining on later, Lord. We ask that your Holy Spirit would aid us and ele elevate our minds up heavenward, that our mind may be open to receiving the truth you have for us this morning. May the study we um, have this morning be a blessing to us all, and may we all be open to participating and adding to the study. Um, and we just ask that your heavenly angels would surround us and rebuke all demonic spirits, and that you would, um, and that this fellowship would be a sweet one, and we would all leave from it blessed. Thank you for hearing and answering this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I don't remember if Christine or Francisco was finishing up from last week, or did we? Yeah, I, I was going to go ahead and share. Okay, so can you see the, where it says in pink left off here? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so let me show you where we're moving on. So from here, okay, so we're um, Desire of Ages, and it's chapter 35, Peace, Be Still. And we got down to here, I think. Uh, let's start with um, 338.2. So meanwhile, a marvelous change had come over. Okay, let's start with the paragraph before. Whenever it says meanwhile, it's like, you know that something happened right before that. <laughs> okay, so let's go with the 338.1. Jesus asked, what is thy name? And the answer was, my name is Legion. So we're at the point where um, he's talking to the demon, demoniac. Okay. My name is Legion, for we are many, using the um, afflicted men as mediums of communication. They besought Jesus not to send them out of the country. Upon a mountainside not far distant, a great herd of swine was feeding, and to these demons asked to be allowed to enter, and Jesus suffered them. Immediately, a panic seized the herd. They rushed madly down the cliff, and unable to check themselves upon the shore, plunged into the lake and perished. Meanwhile, a marvelous change had come over the demonia demoniacs. Light, so the people, where the uh, light had shone into their minds, their eyes beamed with intelligence. The continences, so long deformed into the image of Satan, became suddenly mild. The blood-stained hands were quiet, and with glad voices, the men praised God for their deliverance. Amen. I, I don't know if it's my imagination. I, I have a pretty good imagination. But sometimes when I hear some of the politicians and stuff speak, um, you know, when they're just being outrageously, like, ridiculous, um, it just seems like their faces are so distorted, and I wonder, are they demon-possessed, <laughs> you know? Uh, seriously, I don't know, is it just me, or do I just have a really good imagination? It just seems like their faces are, like, all just not real and distorted. Well, know. it's really, that's really um, interesting, because in this passage, um, this paragraph, it says their eyes beamed with intelligence after the demons were cast out of them. So, you know, to be ignorant and to have a wrong mindset, you really are given over to the other side. Yeah. Because that person who is influencing you is definitely not God. So, yeah, I, I think that, that that's valid in, in many ways. I think about <clears throat> when you're, what, what you're, just us in general, our particular daily frame of mind, our mood, happy, sad, joyful, it all shows an expression. Even if you're not consciously doing it, it shows an expression. Yeah, so, so true. 
So they've got, you know, the expression coming off their face that reflects maybe what's going on inside. That makes sense. Wow. So any, anybody else have any thoughts on that, comments? I just think about the conscience of these people. You know, we can't read the conscience, but you know, for the way that they conduct themselves and what they say they're doing and what they actually are doing probably is very opposite. Mm -hmm. And as far as, you know, what they wanna to portray to the people because they know without the people, they haven't got a chance maybe of uh, being reelected. Right. right. So it, I don't know, it, it, today in this age of politics, it just seems like where are there honest people that are there? Yes, yes. You know, in, in, in taking on political service, it, it, you're supposed to be a servant to, to the people. And now it's a, it's, it's a career choice, you know? Yes. Servant to choice. Yeah. Servant to, servant to self, I mean. Yeah, it is. It's to, exactly. totally opposite. Yeah. And then, of course, the people are suffering. You know, people that were promised things that they were going to be taken care of, not completely, but you know what I'm saying with it. And, you know, they promise the people things so that they will vote for them. And I think people are getting, they're very weary of all of this now. Completely weary, tired of it, know that, you know, there's not honesty there. They say one thing, but they do something else. And it's sure right for, uh, for God's work to be done soon to enlighten people. And I'm very happy to be with you all today. Okay, we're glad to have you. We're so glad you're here. <laughs> oh, I am so blessed and thankful, you know, for God's healing mercies. And, you know, I have missed all of you very much. And it's just like a new day for me. <laughs> it's a new Sabbath. It's good to hear your voice. You sound really good, Jackie. Oh, thank you. And for all your prayers, too. Just... Uh, it's just a blessing to be with you. So, cool. Amen. You know, on that, uh, on that subject of the people being tired of politicians, basically dishonesty, and you know we've seen it over and over and over again, and it's not following through and that kind of stuff. There's kind of a flip side of that that's going on right now, and it's dramatic. And that is that all these people that were Trumpsters or still are, they're seeing that their people are doing what they want them to do. And that's being played out by the Supreme Court. And through Mitch McConnell and the years and years of, that he was working so hard to, to turn things around, you can see that, that certain things are not being done, but other things are overwhelming, uh, <clears throat> not only the court system, but our country and and the Constitution. So things do happen um, in certain respects, let's just say. That's true. Good point. Any other comments? I think in the beginning, most for maybe majority of the politicians, they start off with good intentions. But when they get there, there's there's a there's a you know all the money and the lobbying and the pressure and uh, you know fitting in and and learning the uh, environment that they're in. I think that that you know if you can keep to your convictions, that makes you an exceptional person as a politician because there are probably a lot of pressures from all angles you know, so they start off good, but then they, 
most of the time they turn bad because of the money and the, you know, the, the fame, because you can be, fam- I mean, apologists are famous now, you know? Yes, that's a good point. Any other comments? Cool. So from the cliff, the keepers of the swine had seen all that had occurred and they hurried away to publish the news to their employers and to all the people. In fear and amazement, the whole population flocked to meet Jesus. The two demoniacs had been the terror of the country. No one had been safe to pass the place where they were, for they would rush upon every traveler with the fury of demons. Now these men were clothed and in their mind, um, and in their right mind, sorry. So now these men were clothed and in their right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to his words and glorifying the name of him who had made them whole. But the people who had beheld this wonderful scene did not rejoice. The loss of the swine seemed to them of great moment than the loss of the swine seemed to them of greater moment than the deliverance of these captives of Satan. Okay, that's just crazy. So the pigs are more important than those two men or those two people. Yeah, and and, uh, you know, I posted a quote the other day on Facebook with an article on, I think it was an article on abortion. Um, It might have been the one with John Roberts that that I shared in the teacher chat. But it was there was that quote in the great controversy where she's talking about when the this when this threefold union happens the um, the Protestants the Roman power and spiritualism and then she says that we can know that it's that the time for Satan's I'm trying to remember the word she used maybe somebody remembers marvelous workings to happen. And uh, I'll, I'll find it and put it in the chat, but but um, she's, I'm pretty sure she's marking the Sunday law. I'll find it and I'll put it in the chat. Okay. Yeah, I just find that amazing. So, Go ahead. I, I have a question. Please. So how many swines were there? That's a good question. There was supposed to be a, like a lot. Wasn't it was like thou- thousands or something? Let's see. I know it said it in here. I know there's a great herd. Somewhere and they said their name was Legion. Right. And I and I right. just I don't know why I, I remember like thousands. They said a legion is usually anywhere from four thousand to six thousand. Okay. So something just I don't know. You know, I'm I'm not a farmer. Uh, I'm not a rancher, so but something just doesn't make sense to me here. And I'm just thinking, is there more to this than, you know, is there a parable to this? Because I, you know, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, you, you either a shepherd, you're, you know, um, you're herding sheep or cattle but I've never heard anyone ranching. I mean, not not a hillside. I mean, maybe, maybe that's the way they did in the old days. I don't know. But it just seems strange to me that, you know, because there's the keepers of the swine, right? So I don't know. Is it was it a anybody know? Was it a, a common thing for people to herd swine and let them all out in the field and put them back in? Because usually, I mean, nowadays, you know, swines are in a pen. Uh, and that's where they where they keep the swines. They're not out in the field. You know, it's usually like the lamb or the sheep or the goats that are out in the field. And just to me, it just seems strange that swines would be out in the field. Maybe it's more what swines represent because the field is the world. Right. That's that's what I'm thinking. Is there more of um, a, a parable to this? 
there's just some just doesn't because the, the literal swine being out in the field with the keepers of the cliff, you know, keepers being out in the cliff, watching the swines, it's it, it just Why the literal the literal sense that just not make sense. My understanding, if this is current, anyways, is that the swine was what they made their living in out of. So it was representative of their money. And and who's making this living? Because Jews aren't supposed to be eating pigs. Exactly, which they were. Well, right. I they were, were eating pigs. pigs though. They were, uh, but they were raising uh, swine. For, and for what? Didn't touch them. We're not no, so, so on a surface, nothing here makes sense. Mm -hmm. They had a two-purpose meaning. Most everybody had them. Jews even had them, but they wouldn't touch them. They were the sewer system of that day. And they were, Farmer John's wasn't around to pin them up like he is now today and other such farmers. So a lot of the other people took them as well since they have a purpose. They're mobile sewers and um, we maybe we can raise them and make some money and sell them. So I, you, if they had farmers that not farmers, but people that groups that raise them, yes, they probably raised them into little herd to start doing that as population start growing, the demand and other people starting to eat them. I don't think the Jews as a nat nation ate them, but they did have them as out in the backyard for a purpose. Which God made them for. And so the loss of the swine seemed to them of greater moment than the deliverance of the captives. So imagine our work as we go forward, and then you've got the great work of Satan taking place. And people that love their money are not gonna they're gonna be more upset about their money than the loss of or that the or the salvation of, of life or even the loss of life. They're not gonna care what they care about is what they're losing, what they've personally are losing. Yeah, and so these uh, two men who were demon possessed earlier, you know, they were naked. And now they're clothed. So that just kind of reminds me of garment. Yes, interesting. You know, righteousness because now they're in their right mind so they have their proper clothing on right garment which which makes which puts them in a right right mind sitting at jesus feet listening to his word so i, I so what does what does all nakedness re represent no salvation no righteousness yeah so no righteousness no salvation. So here they were closed. So now they have righteousness. They have salvation. So they're in their right minds. And they're also intelligent before they were ignorant too. Right. So because using their minds. Yes. They have a right mind. They have intelligence beaming with intelligence. Their eyes were beamed with intelligence. That means when they were when they were um, possessed by demons, they were ignorant. Totally. What we were talking about earlier, the expressions on the face of, right. of such a condition. Right, so this also reminds me then of the nature of man, where the mind is in the higher power. Yes. And your lower power, that's where your emotions are. And that's where we always, most of the time, go wrong is with our, with, you know, when we, lead with our emotions so you know when you're demon possessed i mean that that theory the theory of demons that's that's your emotions you're so angry you can't think straight i mean we heard of that expression you know you're so angry you can't think you can't see straight and so now they have their higher power back now that now they can think with their mind and not their have their emotions toyed with. Because I think somewhere up there, Ellen White said they these men wanted to say something, but they couldn't because the demons were in the possession. And, and, and from here, it just sounds like if demons are in possession, they're in possession of the lower power, so, so much so 
that even if we want to say something good, we can't. And that's why, I don't know if I have my son, that's why Jesus looks on the heart and he was able to see. And there are other, there. Are, I think there's others besides this one that talks about that, that he knew the longings of the heart, but the person wasn't able to speak. Right. Trying, trying to find that verse in Isaiah, and I just went to go do a search and didn't come up with swine. <laughs> I know it's in there. In like chapter 61, 62, somewhere in there about the swine's flesh, those that are eating swine's flesh. If anybody remembers that, I'm trying to find that passage. For sure, it's at the end of the chapter. But uh, anyways, go ahead. I'll, if I find it, I'll post it. There's comments in the chat and uh, um, Susan comments, uh, pork barrel uh, politics, question mark. Um, and then she uh, defines it, pork barrel politics have been present in the United States legislative and to a lesser degree executive branches since 1800s, generally used in a derogatory manner. The term refers to the practice of politicians trading favors with cons constituents or special interest groups in exchange for political support. This can come in the form of votes or campaign contributions. Pork barrel politics, also known as patronage, primarily or exclusively benefit just one group of people, even though it's almost always funded by the larger community. So that's, that's a good reference. And then Sarah says, I think he was in Samaria when this happened. So the Samarians, were they, um, they were mixed, right? Because weren't they part Jew? What'd you uh, say? The Samaritans, were, weren't they like part Jew and like mixed? Yeah, they were mixed. They yeah. came from when the Israel was taken off captive uh -huh. and then it was repopulated with the Assyrians. I might have it wrong, the Assyrians are repopulated. Yeah, yeah, Assyrians. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, yeah, and then they right. became the, the mixed race called the Samaritans. I think there's more to it than that, but that's what I remember off the top of my head. So she's making a good point because so they weren't like actually in Jerusalem, but so they were in the Samaria area uh, where having pigs makes a little bit more sense or can. I don't know. <laughs> so, so if, if the swines represent unrighteous people that's what i'm thinking now, who are the keepers if shepherd you know if the shepherd is the the keeper of the flock who is the keeper of the swine well hmm. i have two thoughts on that but the first one is that that it would be the leadership probably but there's another, um, I can't remember the other thought that just popped in my head that made that kind of seem like, no, that wasn't it. But I, but I mean, we know that there's a leadership that is, oh, because it, because it seems to me to depict the rich, the rich people as well, the ones concerned more about their money, but maybe it's not necessarily rich. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Can it be a, a counterfeit leadership? A counterfeit of so because you have a a a, flo um, a flock is that a is that a, word? a herd of swine as opposed to a herd of sheep, uh, each having their own. I mean that's not in there, but you know, um, so a counterfeit flock, a counterfeit church, a counterfeit leadership. I don't know. I'm just. Yeah, because this is, yeah, Log and then Logina just brought up, you know, we got the swine, mm -hmm. we got the keepers, and then we got the employers. Say that again. We have, we the, we, we have the swine, mm -hmm. we have the keepers of the swine, and then we have the employers that the keepers are reporting to. So the keepers would be like the owners of the swine. 
And who employs them? Well, it's interesting. It would be Satan. And you go to Matthew 13 and you have the, the servants in the field. Those are God's people. And you have Satan's people that are his servants as well. Mm -hmm. So the fight that we fight, you know, we know it's a proxy war. We don't go into the Sunday law fighting Satan directly. It's not Christ directly fighting Satan. It's the truth shining in the darkness, fighting Satan's servants to save God's people from among them. Susan writes in the chat that they would be slaves of the employers. Right, the, the keepers, I'm getting my words mixed up, but yeah, the, the shepherds would be slaves to the employers, good point. so much symbology <laughs> we could go in all sorts of ways with this yeah, you're really good yeah. that's, that's the reason why um the employers were mad well the keepers were you know they're going to get in trouble because they lost the flock so they're upset of that um because they're you know accountable in some way but the employers which would be satan and uh of course he wouldn't care about the life of the the, the demoniacs he cares about the money right he always does. Yeah, and earlier, I think Elaine brought up money. <clears throat> and it just kind of re that kind of reminds me of, you know, the swine, the keeper, and the employers. The employers being the um, stockholders because they're the employers, the stockholders, and and the or or the, or the shareholders, because that's what's going on. I mean, if, if we're looking at, uh, I don't know if you heard recently about uh, CVS. You know, they got ten percent of their cl uh, stores clo closing, and uh, what's going on with? Uh, I think the the one percent of the pharmaceuticals. The reason that they're withholding uh, uh, the, the vaccine, the uh, the formula, they're not willing to share, even though they made the formula with a vaccination formula with public money, they're not willing to share it with the public, with the world, uh, because that, they would lose money for the shareholders. So you got the shareholders, you got the ones you got the money, then you got the shareholders, and you got the ones who are working for the shareholders. Wow, that's amazing that they won't share it. Yeah, you know, I, I, I was listening to this um, Frontline, they did a series of documentaries on anti antibiotic resistance. And I mean, they did it in the 2013, 2014, and how it was a problem then, and um, how all these pharmaceutical drug companies decided to stop making new antibiotics because it was no longer profitable because what they found was when you made the antibiotics, the doctors were told to make sure you tell the people or you know, when you're prescribing these antibiotics, you only prescribe them when they need them, absolutely need them. Because if you use antibiotics too often, what will happen is it will no longer be effective. And so the pharmaceutical companies looked at this as like, well, you know, what profit is we going to get a, from creating a drug that is, is going to eventually not work? And then now we got to go create more. So money wise, it didn't make no sense for them to do that. So all the pharmaceutical drug companies decided not to, you know, develop any more types of diff different types of strains of antibiotics. Only Pfizer decided to continue that. But Pfizer eventually found out that yes, money-wise, it didn't make good economic sense. 
So they stopped really making any more antibiotics. And now you come to 2021 and we have these pandemics and then we have these bacteria infections that turn into uh, infections that now the antibiotics that, that we just have because we haven't created any more to combat the, the changing environment of bacteriology and that's happening today. I mean, bacteria is, is um, mutating to levels that you know people just can't even understand. And now we have these antibiotics that are literally not sufficient to deal with these bacteria that are forming. And so it's like a huge thing and, and they still don't wanna develop antibiotics. And I'm guaranteeing you, if you had these new strains of antibiotics, you wouldn't have had all these people dying of COVID-19 because they were dying of a bacteria, secondary bacteria infection, which the antibiotics could not do anything for. So yes, it's all about the money. It always has been and it always will be. The shareholders have to be satisfied. That's their main goal, unfortunately, is keeping the shareholders happy. What a difference with Christ when your main purpose is the, is the people, the salvation, the, the health and healing of the people. That's the difference. Yep. It's, it's the souls, not, not the selfless or selfish. Yeah. That's why we had medical missionary. That's, you know, to help people. And uh, there was no money. <laughs> There's no money in it. Well, there shouldn't be. Now you have hospitals and, and that's all about the money too, you know? So it's really sad. Yeah, that is really sad. Um, so it's easy to get sidetracked in your mind off, off on that. <laughs> Frustrating. Any other comments? Yeah, just adding on to um, the last sentence on that paragraph, but the people who beheld this wonderful scene did not rejoice. So again, that is like the shareholders. They, they also benefited for this, the, the swine herd to be there. And then now that the, um, those swines, you know, perished into the, to the ocean, they, they have no way now of getting their income. So again, back down to the money, not to the people, not to those two individuals that were, you know, uh, lost, but to them, they, you know, they were just, I don't know, savages and they were not people at all. Right, that's a good point. They were, they had been, um... I forget the word, but when you uh, dehumanize a person. Mm -hmm. So like in our communities with um, any person of color getting a, a lift up, people, um, a lot of people are not happy about that, even though it's so good for everybody. Uh, or if women get a, a lift up, people are not happy about that, even though it's good for everyone, they don't rejoice. Because uh, women and people of color have been dehumanized. Any other comments? It was in mercy to the owners of the swine that this loss had been permitted to come upon them. They were absorbed in earthly things and cared not for the great interest of spiritual life. Jesus desired to break the spell of selfish indifference that they might accept his grace, but regret and indignation for their temporal loss blinded their eyes to the Savior's mercy. Wow. It brings my thoughts to this world of, you know, like with the tornadoes and and floods and fires, people losing their belongings, but it's all just earthly belongings. And what it is instead is God um, 
taking an interest, Jesus desired to break the spell of selfish indifference that they might accept his grace. Yeah. In mercy that it had been permitted to come upon them. Yes. So these these disasters that have been going on and everything else that's going on is, is God's mercy pleading with a dying world, dying world to draw them unto himself. And people don't understand that, you know, they don't under, they don't know God, they don't know his character and they don't know. So some will exercise faith when these things happen and some will blame God when these things happen. Exactly. People are always saying, well, why did God let this happen? Right. Did, you know, he must be heartless, but no, he, he desires our, our best interest. They just don't understand the nature of the kingdom. Elaine? Yeah. I thought I would add when 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 I was reading, reading together with you, um, that, that it was in mercy um, that God allowed that loss to come about. It just reminds me that that the the the, the, the biblical principle that you can do nothing against the truth, yeah. but for the truth, because even even Satan and his ways of going against God ultimately prove what the truth is. And, and um, I know this is a, a different idea, but it's just, it just reminds me that, that God is so completely in charge. And even though the wrong seems so strong in this world and everything seems to be, you know, bent, I mean, we know that, that I don't care what government you set up on this planet, um, it's already has one foot on a satanic banana peel because you've got you've got a sinful human heart, you know, at, at the core. And so, um, you know, you can do nothing against the truth before the truth. And and even even when Satan seems to make some gains in some way in the in the end, he loses. And it just it just magnifies the truth even more. And just the thought that came to me as we're reading this. Hey, remember um, Elder Parminder, I think it was in Portugal, saying that, um, maybe it was somewhere else before, but that God's not, and I don't want to say this wrong, so help me if you remember what I'm talking about, that God's not saving the world, he's saving his people that are in the world. So out there in your town, my town, this nation, other nations, among them are God's people. And I used to think of myself and I still kind of do. It's like, it's like he knew who I was before. He knows who we are before we're born, right? But he surely knew who I was before I did because when I would trace back the steps of my own experience many years ago with emotional abuse and taking me from that step to 20 years later before I ever picked up a Bible, I would my way to explain it or what the way I understood it in my own mind was that back then God, because the changes that I went through at that time were so rapid. And then from there, I always wanted to help women that were in, in, you know, in abusive situations. And, and uh, so I started to learn that he was teaching me the principles of seed sowing before I ever even knew him. So so he knows who we are and and uh so to me it was like he looked down and said like what he did with job consider my servant elaine she doesn't know who i am yet but i'm going to teach her some things that she's not going to understand but one day she will so you look at the people that are now you know you got levites and nethanims out there amidst all this happening he's not saving the world he's saving his people out of the world because they are out there. There are people that maybe they don't even, um, well, they probably, I mean, surely they don't know him, but maybe they aren't even religious people, but they, they, they have, they have um, characteristics of that goodness and mercy and kindness and all of that. And, and you know, because I don't think it's just religious people that are, that are going to be 
saved. I mean, the religious people are very many of them are the worst. So, so the, these purposes are for the attention of people. And uh, hang on, just one second, let me. Okay, so so God's people are out there, and uh, I, 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 I like I said, amidst all this, and um, and His people, His sheep, will hear His voice and they'll follow Him. So when we take that and understand the agricultural model, as we know it, that the Nethanims have received their plowing, they're finishing up with their former rain and they're getting ready to go to their latter rain. I think about my own journey. I certainly wasn't here in 1989. I didn't even begin reading the Bible until 2003. So I was unaware of any of that. But yet that's regardless of, of my, I mean, those things all transpired without me um, understanding anything that was going on. But our reactions to them, you know, like this reaction here, they don't care that someone is just has just been delivered out of Satan's hands, you know, and think about your own responses in the past, your own responses to devastation. I remember 9-11. I, I remember my responses of how horrible and how sad it was and thinking about all the people. And you got to think that out there, there's those people that are thinking about all the money. What's this going to do to our economy? What's this going to do to, you know what I mean? Their first priority is their stuff. And some people's first priority is people. The way I see it, it, oh, excuse me. No, go ahead. I just want to say that, 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 you know, we have to understand that, you know, Yes, God's his 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 children will hear his sheep will hear his voice, and we know that. But as far as every single human being that's ever lived, God's given us the power to choose. And so the reality of it is, we were all every one of us, except Adam and Eve originally, we were born in sin, we were born in Satan's camp, and so it's by the Spirit of God and by the decisions that we make. It's our choice. It's always been our choice. It's our choice in the end, whether we're saved or not. It's our choice whether we go along and we're on this arc in this movement and we decide to, to abandon ship. All along the way, it's choices. And, and, um, <clears throat> and God wants us to just continue to follow him all the way. And, and that's why it's really important. That's why we can't just say it's once saved, always saved. And I know it's easy. But look, you know, it, you're, with your life or my own life, each one of us can look at our lives and say, wow, you look at where we came from, you look at the things that God was doing, but as it even says in, in Steps to Christ, long before we're even aware that it's the God's Holy Spirit that's leading us to the truth and to make these decisions, um, he's leading us. And it's it's just a, a more of a, a huge blessing when we actually see God's hand, we recognize it's God's hand, because there was a time in our life that when He was trying to lead, that that we we didn't recognize it was Him doing it at all, and um, so I look at it from that perspective, and and I try to get away from the whole idea of, uh, even though I know I everyone understands what we're talking about here, but that you're, we're not, there's no predestination like oh. You, you're just going to be lost and you're just going to be saved. And, and God knows that our goals are going to be saved and they'll be saved and those are going to be lost. I mean, that's looking at it, you know, from God's perspective that he knows everything, but at the same time, he holds out for all of us. And I guess that's the point I'm bringing out. That, that all, it's a choice that we all have to make all along the way. It's not a one moment choice. And it's like, oh, sorry, you made the wrong decision. So you're lost. That We're talking about myriads of choices we make all along the way whether we're going to listen to his spirit or we're going to reject it yeah choices that's it because part of that whole experience 20 years before i ever picked up a bible and and how i was involved with somebody that was emotionally abusive i in the healing of that that's one of the key things i recognized is that, and I've said, I know I've said this before to some of you, but everything in life is a choice. And if you don't like where you're at in life, it all can be traced back to a choice or cause and effect. 
And it was that principle that I was actually raising my kids with that when I did begin reading the Bible, that was one of the first things I picked up is that principle of cause and effect. Amen. And so they, so, and then when you take that to the study last night, when we were looking at the, the line of the Nephinims, that past inequality isn't enough, but remember what brought them, their first angel brought them through that process to bring them up to this point, right? It, it, so, so, I mean, like you're saying, God had, has a hand in it and people don't even know it. I guess that's the way to say it. God has a hand in it and people don't even know it. So their first angel is bringing them all the way up, has brought them all the way up to this point, preparing them for this point, because every step along the way, you have to make a choice. And what's going to rise to the top or the nephonyms that are going to rise and join this movement are those that actually care about humanity. That when they come to this choice and then the next choice and then the next choice and some choices involve a sacrifice, you know, and they're like, and I remember myself sitting <laughs> years ago, sitting at my desk, sitting there thinking, wow, I don't want to know anymore because what I was learning was really scaring me. This is a long time ago. And I'm talking about the Bible and uh, it was really scaring me. And I sat there and, and it's like, I didn't know it at the time, but uh, several verses, not the actual verses, because I was pretty new to reading the Bible, but the concepts that I picked up is that, you know, I remember reading somewhere that you're, you're accountable for what you know. So the more you know, the more accountable you are. And I sat there and thought, wow, I know a lot. It's way worse to turn back now. And I can laugh now because I knew nothing then compared to what we know now. But, but you, you know, it's more accountable. So, so you, every step of the way, like you're saying, Bob, is a choice. And, and, and I, I used to, I used to talk to my kids when they got to be their teens and going into high school, because I'm more worried about um, getting involved with relationships and what may come of that. And, and I would emphasize to them that one wrong choice can change the whole course of your life. And, and so taking that to what, where we're at today, you know, people's choices can change the course of their life, but we're proving every, every, every step of the way, whether we love God and love humanity or we love self and our stuff. So the nethonyms will have to do that too. The nethonyms are going to have to recognize all that. Then they're, they're going to, I don't remember the exact phrasing that she used, but they're going to have to recognize um, all that, that this movement stands for and choose this movement. Amen. Amen to every thing that was mentioned. I I think about providence a lot because I've read in um you know spirit of prophecy like um a while back and it's interesting because when I try to find that statement it, it's hard for me to find but um Ellen White says we're to be students of providence. Um and ever since I read that statement like you know I try to understand the things that happen in my life um, or like how things led up to, um, I guess, where I am in the present or, you know, um, to make sense of things, you know, and how God is leading and what it all means. And then when you come to understand, you know, parables and, you know, you see a bigger impact of what that um, even says about, one's life and what that means and how everything is to help us to understand God, you know, it just makes me like, how does providence fit into this? Um, I guess that has always been kind of like um, something on my mind, um, even now in my present life and experiences, you know, um, because yes, there is cause and effect there is, you know, choice, but then God is also leading and, you know, how this all works out and how things come to be, you know, where does providence fit in that? If that makes sense? I don't know. I, that's probably a deep, deep question, but um, that's something that I've been trying to understand for the longest. Uh, if anyone has any comments. Thought, but I think I'll hold it. 
personal experience that I don't want to, I, I don't care about bringing personal experience, but going back to the young reckless days of my life. But I can, I can just at least say that I know that there's times where it seems like, why am I even still alive? I don't know if that's going along with what you're saying, but that's what I was thinking about. Just trying to understand, um, not necessarily so much a personal experience, but just like, just providence in itself and how um, God's hand is in our lives. And I mean, and us co-working, co-laboring with God and, you know, how things just seem to work out or, you know, I don't know, just providence, you know, where does that fit? And all that we know, like including our, our, our willpower and um, just knowing that God has a plan and, you know, um, how we fit in that and, and, and being in alignment with that, you know, that plan and that work, you know, um, I don't know. I think Providence, there's something to Providence that um, plays a role in it, but to what degree and what that means in the depth of that, you know, that I don't know. Maybe the gathering that's, I mean, has anybody ever contemplated what we're actually living through and, and how God is and has been gathering his people? We see, we can look through the dispensations of this movement. We can see the shakings. We can see the truths that are brought out. And um, we can see rebellion as it, as it continues. And yet it's through that truth that brings that shaking that tests and proves the hearts. Do we really love him and press on and go forward? Or do we really love self? Every step of the way, like Bob said, it's a choice. It's amazing when we really think about God orchestrating all of that, not just with our own individual lives and not just with this movement, but with all people in all institutions. However, I don't know how to explain that. I mean, we don't have an explanation for it, but but that all of these things, all things work together for good for those that love God. Doesn't mean that all things that happen are, you know, look at Kentucky. And they're not all, they're not good things, but all things work for good for those that love God. So the loss of the swine was good for some. And you can see it was bad for others. In regard to providence, you know, it was really good for the. Uh... Go ahead, Bob. I was, I was going to say, in regard to providence, um, I believe that we're going to be studying God's providence for all of eternity, um, and we can look back with awe, even just looking at humanity and how God's been providing and working with humanity since since our since you know Adam and Eve sinned, and all the way along what He's doing. And so it's it's not something I think that we're going to ever come to the point where we think we've arrived um, with it. It's just it's something that we're going to hold hold God in awe for you know for eternity. Go ahead, David. Amen. I was just going to say that yeah, it was a disaster, you know, for those pig farmers, and it and and like the reading says it woke the people up, you know, in a certain sense, like when they lost all this um, great wealth, it really was for them, how, you know, God was trying to get them to see a spiritual thing. And so then what happens, we all know the story that the demoniacs, they become the first missionaries, basically, before the disciples do, they go back to their own town. And they start telling all the people what God had done for them. And the people start listening. Well, then, I don't know how much longer it was. Jesus comes back over there, Decapolis, and he starts doing miracles over there. And so this is kind of a progression, you know, how he wakes them up, 
sort of like a plowing, you might say, when the, the um, swine go over the cliff and all that stuff, the people all of a sudden are shook out of their, you know, lethargy of money, you might say. And then all of a sudden the demoniacs are preaching to them how great God is, which they probably didn't want to hear too much about that. But eventually it seems to seep into them. So it softens them up to the point when Jesus comes back over there, you know, he's got a harvest that he's working on over there. So it was just interesting how this whole progression went through. Um, it was a shock in the beginning, and then at the end, it saved souls. For those of us as parents, just going back to the word providence and the stuff that Christine just posted, for those of us that are parents, you know, we would set out to do our very best. Um, well, prayerfully, we have, but I know there are people that don't do this. They don't they they think of in the moment with their kids and raising them instead of realizing that they're raising them to have to go live in the world and they need to be able to know how to um you know how to survive and how to behave and all of that so but you but imagine though as a parent you really want to help mold and shape and direct to where they make good and right choices all along and just think about god and his providence and and calling us knowing that at any moment we could take another turn and say hey i don't like that you've taken me too far you know and i've heard people make these statements in the movement that that god's maybe taken it way too far that you know, when it comes to the whole lgbt um issue and gender it's just going all too far and, and so then they turn back. So imagine his great love for us, preparing the, the time that he woos us to, to prepare us to be able to handle the light that he shined upon our path, knowing that that very light may be the straw that breaks us and turns us back and the heartache that, that he must experience for, um, for those of us that don't don't handle it and press on. So I encourage us all, we keep going no matter what. We keep going because it will all be worth it. And it's not just for us that we're here. He's doing it to prepare people to go out and harvest from the world, the, the, the Levites and the Nethanims, to harvest them from, from all of what they're in. And like I said last night, put it, put, put that work as your priority and you won't have the problems that you might have if, if you're, if you're still having problems with bad habits or, you know, things that are defiling yourself or, or what have you, um, let that be your strength. Let the salvation of others be your strength. Let God's grace give you power to hate sin, knowing that if we sin, and we fail, then we fail others. Um, I, I started thinking, Elaine, when you were talking about, you know, when you came in, you weren't in the church 1989, and it jarred my memory. <clears throat> I like, came into it in 88. And you know, and I hooked up with a, you know, um, woman who later exposed me to writings of the pioneers. And we were hooked up together for quite a while. But um, in 92, 91, 92, there was a local church, the North Aurora Church at the time, just will ring a bell for Bob. <laughs> he was there too. Um, they had a Daniel Revelation seminar and I attended Daniel portion of it in a grade school or something. They were holding the meetings in the grade school. And then the rest of the meetings they held at the church and it was a pastor, Russell Burrell. I still remember. He Me too. Yeah, he, he, he baptized Liz. I don't know if you remember Liz. Liz is from the uh, Hinsdale Church, the 180 group. 
And when I confronted her later about some of these things, she, you know, told me, oh, yeah, he, he baptized me. But anyway, during the revelation portion of it, he started talking about, at some point, he talked about Orion. I never heard about this, about what scientists were finding in Orion through the Hubble telescope and things like that. You got, you got a lot of background noise. I can't quite hear you. Oh, yeah, it's the wind. I'm walking That's around. Thought. Okay. That's what I thought. Okay. But anyway, the thing that really got me, he, unlike the other people who did Revelation seminars, he started talking about Daniel 11. And I was clueless. He was talking about the king of the north, king of the south, and what had just happened in the Soviet Union. And this was out of nowhere for me about how the Pope was the king of the north and the Soviet Union was the king of the South and all that, about how the, you know, the king of the North had conquered the king of the South. And I even, I even purchased a set of audio tapes on the subject, but I don't remember ever fully understanding it. I was struggling and I didn't know if it was true because nobody else in the church was talking about this. How did I know if anything he was saying was true? And then it took another few years of you know, being exposed to the writings of the pioneers and borrowing books from, you know, um, this friend of mine, Shirley Bauman. <laughs> she had a library you could die for. Um, she started lending me Stephen Haskell books, Daniel and Revelation, and I ended up reading those instead of your eyes, Smith. It seemed like it was easier. And that, and that was the late 90s, like 98, 99. I finally sat down to start reading through that Revelation 9. Um, and, and it's about that time I got on the internet and I hooked up uh, with a website, Temple Cat. And that was Pat Temple, who was in later, you know, working along with Jeff Whippen. And it was like, I, and then I was later in the 90s. I'd moved to Chicago and <laughs> I was attending a Sabbath school class by a guy who was really pushing the health message and stuff. That's why I sat in on his class, Francis Victor. And he would hand out stuff to us. And it wasn't until years later, after I got in the movement, I went through this stuff and I found the, some page he had photocopied from one of Jeff's newsletters. <laughs> and I saved this thing for years. Now, I can't remember what it was about, but I think I still have it. But it was like little by little along the way, um, I just never found any support for any of it. I never knew anybody who knew anything about it. So it was just something I had to keep to myself and try to understand. And anyway, and then we, we all got hooked up with Jeff and he was pulling us <laughs> certain direction and then we had to be pulled back in another direction by elder Berminder. <laughs> it was just but it's been 30 years it just occurred to me i have known something about the king of the north and the king of the south for 30 years wow i just like wow has it been that long but went for many years at least 10 you know five to ten years not knowing anything really and so i got a hold of those books and now today, that same person, that, fr that old friend of mine, she's just way too conservative whenever I tried to talk to her about any of these things. Although she, she, she read that little Daniel Revelation book I gave her and she told me it was true. But she was hooked up with the Trinitarian, anti-Trinitarian people, and that was her soul. <laughs> but I, I couldn't pull her back out of it because we were becoming more liberal and there was no way a conservative Adventist was going to have anything to do with that. But yeah, my memory got jarred. <laughs> and I don't know if I remembers anything about him talking about the King of the North and King of the South. He attended that seminar. <laughs> but I just wanted to put that out there. Anyway. <laughs> wow, I'm really, um, I'm just amazed that we have people in this group, Linda, Bob, and whoever else, that have been progressing in this movement for such longevity. I mean, we're very blessed. 
I'm very blessed. I feel very blessed because we have, we can learn a lot from people who have been in this movement for this extended period of time. And I just want to make a comment about Providence. I am so grateful and so thankful that God's providence is going to prevail because it's really, it's nothing of us, it's all God. And it is so comforting to know that he is in control and his will will be done on earth. It's just, it's a comforting, wonderful feeling. And I also want to make one, one more comment about just before, um, I think Elaine was talking about money and how the world is so caught up and consumed with the money, you know, the nethodims and so on. And the thing is, even the people in the church are that way, even pastors, um, you know, oftentimes we judge or gauge a church success by the amount of people in the congregation, by how big the church is, by how much money a church may, brings in. And so that same mentality is even in the church, unfortunately, and all churches. So it's, uh, th there's a reason why uh, Jesus said, you know, uh, the love, he, he spoke to that noble man and he said, what can I, what can I do to, to gain heaven? And he said, Give all your things to the poor and you will have heaven. You will, you will have eternal life. And he couldn't do it. So. If I could just put a clarification out there. Um, it, it, you know, I became an Adventist in 1984. And um, coming from Catholicism, when I, when I came into the Adventist church, I realized right away that the Advent people were sitting on the gold mine of truth. And yet most of the people that I met in the Adventist church were not studying or living or even knowing a fraction of what was in that gold mine. And so that spurred me to just study. But as far as me being part of the movement, I don't, I don't feel that I, I didn't even know Jeff, I did, wouldn't become anything part of the movement until almost 2014. So um, there was a lot of work, as you say, with God's providence that he's leading us and guiding us along the way. And each one of us have a unique path. We're all, we all have a story that we're gonna be telling for eternity about God's providence and his leading and, and our experience that each one of us have had through sin and how God's rescuing us. So um, it's just a beautiful thing, but, um, yeah, the history goes back to, for me, 1984, when I became an Adventist, but I did not have any formal acknowledgement or recognition of the movement itself until till the end of 2013, almost 2014, just to clarify. Yeah, and if I heard you correct, or, or help me to understand, did you, did you refer to the beginning of your Adventist journey as you found the gold mine? Is that what you what you said? That's what I said. Yeah, because that's how it was for me too. Because I I didn't have any religious background, and uh, I just said, well, there've been a couple times in my life I thought about wanting to read the Bible, not ever really even not. I I totally am one of those people that had no idea what it was, and but I really wanted to read it, and finally I started to read it, and it took me from there maybe a couple of years or I think I think that was two thousand three to where I started to understand that the Bible wasn't talking about Sunday. And that I, I don't know how I knew that other than the Holy Spirit put that thought in my mind, but I was like, why are they to sound like they're not talking about Sunday? So, which eventually led me to um, the Seventh-day Adventist church. But I was in the meantime, I was like searching all these different denominations because my prayer when I picked up that Bible was, I don't know how there can be all these different beliefs if there's only one god please show me the truth and so so when i found the seventh day adventist church that's exactly what my mind was like is that they're they're sitting on this gold mine and and within three years i saw what terrible condition they were in and then eventually outgrew what they even taught and uh and i know i was told a couple of times that 
um, if everybody knows, I went to, I think many of you know, I went to Sac Central and Pastor Doug was there. And, um, and another pastor, you know, there were times where, where Pastor Doug would say things that, you know, up in the sermons that was like, no, I mean, that's not right. And, and I would, and I have emailed him a couple of times and things like that, but they, this, this other pastor, the one that actually baptized me, he was like, well, I think you ought to, you know, at least make that sound a little nicer. He was very supportive of Pastor Doug, very protective of Pastor Doug. You should um, make that a little nicer. And what I said was truth. It wasn't trying to be mean. It was just truth. And and um, so it was just an interesting journey along the way to, and, and then to go from that to understanding the 2520 and having that pastor that baptized me do a sermon that talked about um, after a after a hearty conversation with exchange in email, well, I say hearty, I'll just leave it at that, um, goes and preaches a sermon about Cora Dathan and Abiram and about people um, not listening to the leaders and thinking that they're holy and, and uh, not listening to their leaders. And so he was putting himself up there as Moses and me as Cora Dathan and Abiram. And I remember that day people came in and said, because they knew what I was studying, they came in and said, are you hearing what he's saying? He's talking about you. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. And, and, uh, and I'm sitting there literally feeling like he has no idea that the earth is going to open up and swallow him. I mean, I was real naive. It, 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 it you know, God's working and and yet I do know that God opened up the ground and swallowed those people. Or I don't want to say God, but you know what I mean? The ground opened up and those people were swallowed in it. And I'm sitting there thinking, I don't know what this is going to look like today, but he has no idea he's on the wrong side of things. It was an interesting journey for all of us, I'm sure. Now, I, I have a similar little story. Right now, I feel embarrassed, <laughs> but... We was having a Revelation seminar in 2013, 14. We was all attending, and this one guy disagreed about who the stone was, which we have now found out that it is not the second coming of Christ. It's us coming out of the church. Well, the whole everybody, no, no, you're wrong. That stone is Jesus, the second coming of Jesus Christ. He said it can't be because the stone applies before the second coming of Christ. Yeah. He did not exactly know who or what it was, but he knew it was not the second coming of Christ that's destroying the system. It's us that will destroy it. And that's just so amazing. Now I feel so stupid because we all like, where did you get that from? Where did you get that well, from? That's, we just, a, that's a Protestant doctrine. Yeah, yeah, and the church was teaching that problem, which now we find out that was just very wrong. But he knew it wasn't wrong. The timing is not right. It's not second to come. You got Christ coming too many times. <laughs> and then, and, and, no, you're all wrong. You're all wrong. He said, no, I'm not. He held to his ground. <laughs> and I'm like, couldn't find out we was all wrong. <laughs> not him. <laughs> well, praise God for his leading in our lives. And I often think and praise God that I'm even here because He's brought us all up to crossroads, and any one of us could, still could have turned back, and we never did. And it's not that it's been easy every step of the way, you know, especially for, for you know, in these last two years, what's considered this time of trouble, and prayerfully everybody understands that the 144,000 go through each harvest, and each harvest is a time of trouble. And, but some of the some of the pressure that I felt on me over the last five years, at times I thought I was going to lose my mind and, and there was no way I could keep going forward. It was just all too much. And yet I still sat there that same way that I did years ago when I said, where else is there to go? You have to go forward. And, and I thank God that we're still here. And I pray that each and every one of us press on and, and are ready with that forehead of flint, with the armor of God, and with the love for, for 
God's people that are out there to yet come in, that they come before that myself included, I, I am just as, you know, um, challenged as anyone else when it comes to the, the you know, the, the line of selflessness, you know, where do you draw that line? You, you have to work, you have to do this, you have to do that. Where do you draw that line? How do you, you know, what does, what does, like when Fel said, what does that faith look like? What is it, does this total selflessness look like, you know, when it comes to forsaking all and going in and doing God's work? God help us all to understand and be ready to go wherever he calls, whenever he calls, whether it means we still stay right where we're at and this is how we do the work, whatever it is, may we press on. And uh, because there he is, as Peter said, where else is there to go? He has the words of life. And we have the words of life to give to those that are thirsty and hungry and waiting. And as Isaiah 51 says, that they are hasting to break loose. Hasting, hastening, maybe it said hastening to break loose. That's ironic. That's what I forgot to mention. Kind of ironic in a way that all along the way, I was getting little tidbits of things. And but I think if it were not for one person, one particular person, I may never have gotten into the movement because Jeff Pippinger was the best kept secret <laughs> in the Adventist church. And I actually wasn't even attending church, but I went to a little health seminar thing one of the members of the Hinsdale Church was having in her home. It was some clay doctor thing because we were all into the health message. And there was someone there who I kind of got hooked up with. And we, you know, exchanged ideas and talked about what we were interested in. And at some point she said, Oh, you got to go see this guy because he's, he's going to be in Downers Grove, Illinois. I said, okay. I was looking into other things, conspiracy theories and that kind of thing. And it was Jeff Fippinger. And then again, when he came two years later, I went to see him. By that time, I had watched a lot of videos, whatever he had made. And then we were, along the way, we were, after that, getting together and having Friday night studies. And I don't know who it was, whether it was her or it was someone else, probably it was her, invited Bob. And we were all meeting at this one guy's house in Elmhurst, Illinois. And that's how he got into it. But even before that, we were inviting speakers in the movement to come out here to speak and also interacting with them on Skype. One of them came to the Hinsdale Library, Anthony Korn. And so we went to go see him and she had probably invited Bob. <laughs> and we were all sitting there and I happened to turn around and there was Bob. Hadn't seen him in who knows how many years. But I think it was the same person who invited me to check Jeff out it was the same person that invited Bob because it was a mutual friend. Yep, correct. So that was, yeah, kind of ironic. And she, you know, was instrumental in getting other people too um, to start looking at the stuff. Could hand out DVDs and stuff. Well, but sadly. Most of the people, most of the people who were instrumental in bringing you know, numerous people into into this movement are no longer in the movement. That's that's well, the, the I, sad part. I've wondered about it because there's certain people I never see in the meetings anymore. You know, I don't know what's going on, but no, they're not. You know, they're not. Okay, yeah. I mean, where are they? You know, I could have sworn I saw, you know saw them up to a certain point but uh and i don't know why or whatever but some of the people we used to meet with out here they left in 2014 
2014, you know, it was a big year. I mean, everybody split. Yeah. It's unreal, but yeah, everybody was split and going into every direction of the wind. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, so we are here, whoever we are. So I just, so 2008, 2008 was the year for me. It took that long. But if it weren't for that one person, I don't know who else. There was nobody else. And I wasn't going to church. So, it's, yeah. Amen. Well, there's not much in the study, but really good. Uh, good, I don't know, to, to hear the other stories and how we're here and God's providence and praise God. And there's our praise and Thanksgiving session, maybe. I don't know. But um, so we'll have to close off here. We do have uh, Brendan Bennett from Australia. He's going to do our worship hour presentation, and he'll start at 11. So we'll go ahead and take our break and come back at like 10, 15, and uh, do prayer and praise. Does somebody want to close in prayer? Maybe Bob? Okay. Dear Lord in heaven, Lord, we we have such awe and and wonder at your love and for your leading and your providence. And and Lord, I know that that um that each one of us have a unique story to tell and and you are you're leading each one of us and continue to lead us now and i just thank you for for your holy spirit i thank you for the heavenly angels who are who are working very hard in our behalf look forward to being able to meet them and to to fellowship with them and understand their their um leading and guiding in our lives as well and uh, lord we know that, that you are in charge of everything and that um that the truth will prevail and as elaine has said you know we we have to realize where else can we go you're leading us in the truth and the truth is what sanctifies us it what makes us holy and helps us to be able to have the mind of christ and lord i just thank you for all that you're doing for us thank you for the sabbath that we can come together and study together and i ask all this in jesus name amen amen amen